Today we get some great revenge all by accident. We'll get to that in a bit, but first, they didn't honor their reservation, so... A few months ago, I volunteered to plan my mother-in-law's 60th birthday and my father-in-law's 64th birthday, which was a weekend in wine country. I had made a reservation for a group of 10 at a new upscale restaurant months beforehand. Because it was also a winery, we arrived two hours early and checked in with the restaurant to see if they could seat us earlier. Despite an empty restaurant, they said they couldn't and that was no big deal. We understood they could be low staffed. So we went and got some wine and hung out and listened to live music. Close to our reservation time, I got a text from the restaurant to be seated. It was beginning to rain. We walked over to the hostess. She informed us that because it was raining and because our table was outdoors that they wouldn't be able to seat us tonight. As calmly as I could, I explained to them that I'd had a reservation for months, I've been here for two hours, and I was not told that my reservation was for an outdoor table or subject to rain. There was no indoor-outdoor option. I explained to them that it was for a 60th and a 64th birthday party. I asked if they could just split us up between tables, and they just kept saying that there was nothing they could do and that it wasn't their fault because we can't control the weather. I snapped a little and said sharply, well, what you could have done was not reserve out a table to a large party that you could not guarantee. The manager just shrugged. We left and because it was a Saturday at 6 p.m., there was no way we were getting a seat at another restaurant. I had to go to the grocery store and cook a full meal for 10 people. I emailed the manager to ask them if there was anything they could comp because our experience was so terrible. I got no response after a week, so I made multiple Gmail accounts and left what was a fairly new restaurant 10 different one-star reviews. In the reviews, I said that you should never book this restaurant if you have a large party. How they didn't try to find us a table at another restaurant. How they had two hours to fix their error. That they booked out a table they could not guarantee. That they didn't move a table under cover, which there was plenty. Provide any comps or otherwise make any attempt to fix their error. They ended up with a two star drop in their Google rating because of my reviews. I left one review for every person that did not get a seat. Several days after I'd posted, they reached out offering to comp a meal for my in-laws if our group took the reviews down, which I refused. Isn't it frustrating that only when you're able to actually get through to them and do something that makes them look bad, that only then they're willing to try to help you out, like as if they were some helpful party the whole time? Enjoy your two-star drop and go take your comp somewhere else. Also, hi, I'm Steven, and if you enjoy awesome stories of revenge, why not hit those like and subscribe buttons down below. That said, our next story is, she told me she was going to lie. I work retail. A lady came in to get a warranty evaluation for her product. Upon admitting to me that it was misused, I told her it didn't qualify for warranty since the problem was due to her misuse. After getting yelled at, she ended her argument with, fine, I'll go to another store and tell them I used it properly. I spent the next little while emailing every single store within her reach about how this customer was possibly going to lie to them, along with a description of her and the product. The head office customer service ended up opening a whole case about her. She'll never get her item replaced. Don't tell me your plan next time after you've yelled at me. I was gonna say that this is overly petty, but when you realize that this person came in, flipped a total witch, insulted OP, yelled at them. I mean, it's plenty good. If there's anything to point out, it's her being so dumb as to willingly come in and admit, hey, I misused this, can you repair it under warranty? Just tell the white lie and say it, it broke on its own or something. At least try to be nice, maybe they'd still help you out if you were polite. Our next story is, make your Facebook bio about my pregnancy? Okay, now it's viral how rancid you are. Alright, so my sister-in-law, husband's brother's wife, has really not liked me for some time now. It started with gossip while being fake nice to my face. When we found out, we told her off and she hasn't let it go. A couple years ago, we announced our first pregnancy and she went around gossiping about that. So I decided with this next pregnancy to wait till I'm 20 weeks, halfway, to announce. To hopefully reduce the chances of something so asinine happening. We announced just a few weeks ago, and lo and behold, out of all the things she does, she makes her public Facebook bio, for freak's sake, be more consistent on your birth control, skull emoji. I was shocked, but also not. 
but I would hope considering she's older than me and my husband, maybe she would take the high road by now and ignore any negative feelings about it. I expect her to talk crap about me at this point, and I'm not surprised. But about my unborn baby? My family? Uh, no. What the heck? That's crossing a line. So my revenge? It's already public. You want attention? Okay. I made a TikTok with the screenshot, and now 80,000 people and counting are commenting, talking about how jealous and weird she is. I suppose I could be more petty, but imagining her seeing the mass negative response to what she did is very satisfying. And that is my petty revenge. And it feels great. I'll tell you one thing, TikTok comments are ruthless. So I can tell you without a doubt if this TikTok frames her in the perfect light, there is going to be some savage stuff being said about her. Our next story is, Karens keep stealing from my garden. On a property with a beautiful lawn, and it came with side garden running along the fence bordering the sidewalk, full of herbs like mint, lavender, and oregano, some small carrots and other stuff, quickly learned that several older ladies in the neighborhood felt entitled to my garden. They were reaching through the fence posts up to their shoulders going as far as their arm could reach, grabbing what they could and filling their plastic bags. They would wait till someone was out of the house or early in the morning to make their grab and run, so they were well aware they were in the wrong. Just knowing they were doing this whenever we were out of the house made my skin crawl. So I ripped out the garden. Less work for me now. It honestly became too much work and messy to have, but it wasn't a big deal and there was plenty of it to go around. I hate gardening, so it was a relief to get rid of. I also didn't like that the garden had become an invitation for thieving grannies to intrude on my property. I was planning on removing the garden eventually, but wasn't in a rush and didn't care enough. They just accelerated my plans to get rid of it all by fueling me with spite. If only they had asked and introduced themselves, I probably would have kept it a little longer. 100% they knew they were completely in the wrong, that's why they would try to wait around for the right time. The only thing that would have made this even a little bit better is if they had the gall to like contact you and be like incredulous why you ripped it all out. It's kind of sad to see a garden get ripped out, but needless to say, all of these people did not deserve access to those plants. Our next story is threw out roommate's food. Hello all, this past Sunday I moved most of my things out of my apartment. I have three roommates, one of which is a close friend who's barely there, not even once a week. So this post is about the remaining two roommates. On Sunday I bagged up my fridge items and left them in the corner of the fridge. I did the same for my freezer items and left them in the freezer. Let the roommates know I would be back Wednesday, today, to get my things and drop my keys off. I got to the apartment tonight. And behold, my things left in the fridge and freezer are gone. I text the roommates and ask who threw my stuff out. The roommate I'm friends with slash is never there responded saying she didn't, which I figured. The other two were jerks and don't like me too much. The other two don't respond and have about an hour and a half plus to respond before I do what I did. I end up seeing one out of the two remaining roommates and ask her about where the bags of food went. And she plays dumb and says she has no idea and never saw them. Total BS. No one ever throws stuff out in the fridge slash freezer without asking the others first. That's been a standard with everyone. So after I load up the rest of my belongings in my car, I threw out groceries from the two roommates in the fridge slash freezer. The roommate who I'm friends with slash is never there doesn't have food there. And I know what she has so I avoided those things. It felt good to get even. They threw out new meat, vegetables, produce, name brand stuff of mine, expensive stuff just to be jerks. So I decided to be a petty jerk back. Update, saw one of the two roommates today. I was on the phone the whole time and ignored her. She followed me through a parking garage, to an office, and back. I got into my car, finished my call while she screamed at my window. She tried standing behind my car not to let me out. I waited and she finally moved and I left. I texted her after and said something along the lines of, Hey, I was on the phone and I have to run to work. What did you need to talk about again? Now, did they throw it out or did they probably just try and consume all of it? I mean, I feel like that's probably the more likely outcome here. They probably hate your guts and just ate all of your food. These people were jerks though. And considering like, although they followed you, but they didn't press it too much beyond that, it's pretty clear. They probably both were guilty. Our next story is, mother-in-law peed me off. 
About nine months ago, I went no contact with my mother-in-law after she behaved so unforgivably awfully she caused my husband to have a nervous breakdown, requiring months of therapy and medication. My husband went extremely low contact. He visited her on her birthday and at Christmas, but has asked her repeatedly not to contact him. She changed her abusive tactics, and her current game is to text him and say how much she misses him. Not me or her grandchild, but never mind. And when he doesn't reply, he never does. The next text is a demand for him to return some random item she gave us that we've had for years. So last month, when he didn't reply, she demanded her towel rail back. An old rickety wooden thing that we've had for years that she has no room for. She knows we use it as it matches our bathroom aesthetic. Old and rickety. Whatever. Well, I was fed up with her, so I went around the house and boxed up every darn thing I could find that had been given or lent to us. Baking tins, books, random mugs. Then, I urinated on her towel rail. Really well, I even soaked some cotton wool and left it on the cracks in the paint so it would soak through into the wood. I was hoping the scent of my pee would send her new puppies into a peeing frenzy. I don't know if it did, but I like to imagine it. That's all. She peed me off, so I peed on her things. I haven't told my husband, but it's too funny not to share. It's not too often you hear of a revenge story where the revenge plan is to just pee on stuff. But honestly, I can imagine it would be something that, like, if you're okay doing that, knowing to yourself, you got one up on them. I mean, even if it doesn't, like, actually cause anything to happen and they don't notice, it's one of those things you still have in the back of your mind, like, yeah, I did that. But it's kind of weird. This next story is Entitled Sister Demands Bathroom, and so I... Back when I lived with my dad, we only had one bathroom for the whole family. My little sister was my dad's and stepmom's child, so she was beyond spoiled and favorited. I would literally get grounded for using her chocolate mix to make myself chocolate milk. Since my dad craves for anything she whines about, she always gets what she wants, and she has an entitled and snobby attitude because of it. She demanded for me to get out of the bathroom when I was in under four minutes. She wanted to argue through the door, making it seem like she's the top priority in the house. I said I'll be out in one minute. She huffed and stomped away because she didn't get what she wanted. Boo hoo. I used that minute to lather the floor with conditioner. Once I carefully stepped out of the bathroom, I called her name and said I was out. I hear her running to the bathroom dramatically and then thud. Probably the most satisfying thing I've ever felt. I didn't actually think it would work, but she was running, which most definitely helped. I don't know if anybody remembers that Vine clip, but this makes me think of that one viral clip where somebody was yelling for two kids to come run in and they said, so and so, come in and get your juice. And they had like oiled up the floor. So the kids come running in, they slide across the floor and go knee first into the stove and break the glass and the glass goes everywhere. Our next story is, don't contribute? Don't pretend that you did. One of the managers at work was going through some pretty horrific medical issues. He was well liked, so a collection was pretty inevitable. Of all the staff that knew him well, I was the only one organized enough to get it done, so it fell on me. While he was off sick, I put out an email, put a note on the board, and explained it in the next big meeting that I would be collecting and why. I made it clear that it was his birthday in a little over a month, and it would be a good idea to time it for that. Everyone seemed keen, and I got a lot of donations straight away. I made sure that I got everyone's name who donated, so I could get them to sign the card later on. One of my coworkers, Linda, made a show of saying that she would contribute later when she had the cash available. It was a little odd. Plenty of people don't carry cash, and she didn't need to make a deal out of it. These types of things are never huge amounts of money, and she certainly had plenty of it. But if she didn't want to contribute, I wasn't going to force her. A few weeks before I needed to buy the gift, I sent out an email to all so that they could contribute if they wanted to. And again, a week before. In the next meeting, I let everyone know that I'll be buying a gift that weekend and I'll send out a couple of options later that day. Everyone who contributed could vote. Of all people, Linda starts telling the room what to buy. Despite not putting any money in and still making some pretty unsuitable decisions, I reluctantly agree to put it on the list of choices and send it out to everyone who has donated. I buy the thing and a card and pass it around with a list of names. Someone's holding on to it, so I track it down to get it moving again. 
I happen to see Linda has added not only her name, but a message that takes up loads of space. So I did something very petty. I went and bought a new card, I got everyone apart from Linda to re-sign, and took it round to everyone else, without her knowing. We ended up presenting the gift in a big meeting on his first full day back. He opened the card in front of everyone. I wish I could have seen her face when she realized it wasn't the one she signed. I'm told she was planning to raise an official complaint, but was told not to be an idiot. Imagine raising a complaint because you got excluded from a card that you in no way genuinely contributed to. Did they think, oh well, I pitched an idea for what the gift could be, is enough to be considered acceptable to be on that card? That you contributed in some small way? Not really, no. Our next story is Dead Phone. I worked as a substitute teacher at a school that had a no cell phone usage in class policy. If you were caught, you had to surrender the phone to the teacher when asked, or get written up for defiance if you refused. To make sure this policy worked, the teachers were required to give the phone back when the class was dismissed. So the total effect for the student was to not have their cell phone until the end of the class. One day, I was assigned to sub for a teacher who was known to be very strict. In her notes, she named a student who frequently broke the rules and to keep an eye on her. Three minutes into the class, I saw the student's eyes looking down into her crotch and smiling. I waited, moved into a position where I could see the phone, and told her to hand it over. At first, she refused, saying she was just holding it in her hand. The class giggled. I asked again and she complied after turning off the power, muttering fat freaker after I walked away, again causing the class to giggle. Rather than confront her on that, I simply put her phone on my desk, in a location next to my keyboard, out of sight from the class, and pressed the power button. The petty revenge? For most of the next hour, whenever I was at my desk, I would surreptitiously keep touching the screen to keep it lit up. By the time the class ended, the phone was out of power, and this was the first class of the day in a school with no charging stations. When the bell rang, she rushed up to me, demanding her phone. I was at the classroom door letting the students out, but told her to just grab it from my desk. She did, and was trying to turn it on as she walked by me out the door, showing me who was the boss. I smiled and told her to have a nice day. First thing they want to do is immediately jump on their phone, get on their social medias, chat with people, complain about OP, but they gotta wait the whole car ride home, just to have to put the charger in and wait for it to charge up a few percent. Love that form of revenge. It's just a good thing OP didn't get caught turning the phone back on and kind of messing with it. Cause god forbid, I'm sure OP doesn't want to present the optics of them looking like they're fooling around with a student's confiscated phone. Our next story is Grocery Store Karen. I can't take credit for this one. My uncle is a 76 year old veteran and still sharp as a tack. He's quite the character and always cracks me up with his stories. As some of you may remember, early in the pandemic when no one really knew how COVID was spreading, the only open stores were supermarkets. They essentially made every aisle a one-way only in that everyone was supposed to go in the same direction, so up one aisle and down the next. The problem is, if you forgot an item and went back, you risk going in the wrong direction to retrieve it, or having to go down the aisle next to it just to come back up. I remember a lot of people not really observing these signs as it was kind of absurd. Most supermarkets at the time were also offering special hours for seniors so they could shop in a less crowded store, usually at 7 or 8 am. My aunt and uncle went grocery shopping during this hour. One day while waiting in line to pay, my aunt realized she forgot an item and asked my uncle to go retrieve it, but when he got in the aisle, he was facing the wrong direction. Seeing as though there was only one other person in the aisle, he went down it in the wrong direction, rather than having to go down the aisle next to it only to come back up. But as he started making his way down the aisle, a Karen, clearly not a senior, entered with her cart from the other end of the aisle, going in the right direction. She started making her way towards my uncle, and when she got five feet away, loudly said, You're going in the wrong direction! My uncle, who was looking for his item on the shelf, was startled and turned around. What? Karen even louder this time said, You're going the wrong way. My uncle took a moment to reflect and replied, You know what? You're right. My parole officer told me the same thing. He said, Eddie, you've been going the wrong way your whole life when I was in prison. Karen's eyes grew wide and she couldn't get away from him fast enough. 
this is just great because you can imagine this Karen freaking out in the back of their mind like, what did this guy do? Maybe I yelled at the wrong person, I better get out of here. Nobody needs the canned cranberries this bad. Our next story is Ski Lodge Table Hoarder. Our local ski resort has a mini lodge near the beginner and children's learn to ski area. It has round tables for 8 people and maybe 15 total tables. If it's cold, this is the only place close that people can warm up. Q busy holiday Saturday that was also extremely cold. Lady X, who isn't skiing, and her group of skiers take an 8 top at 9am. Add 2 extra chairs and then lay all kinds of briefcases and bags on the chairs. Then all leave but Lady X. The tables have signs saying no saving chairs and tables. Over the morning, I watch as this packed lodge has this empty table saved with X being the only one at the table 90% of the time. At lunchtime, it's a mob scene. So crowded, three kids were eating on the wet floor beside this woman. Another family was using a trash can to set food on. We had a table beside her but only had three chairs for eight of us, so we're rotating. A dozen people asked Lady X for a chair. She said no each time. Everyone in the lodge was eye-rolling this situation. It was obvious as freak because this is just a small hut. Nobody was outright yelling at her because it was so ridiculous it was funny. The revenge, Lady X got up to go to the bathroom, which was in the back out of sight, and had a bit of a line. I simply distributed 9 of the 10 chairs to tables around her table where people were standing. They all accepted the chairs, and the entire lodge was in on it and chuckling. I left her chair. So she comes back to one chair and an otherwise chairless table. I can't describe her expression. This is the worst kind of person. God forbid, like imagine you get on a bus and there's like a bunch of open seats but everyone has like a jacket sitting in it, a briefcase there. You just need one place to sit down and everybody's just blindly looking away while also trying to take one seat up next to them. You can't help but feel bad for the kids eating on the floor and the people using a trash can as a table. Our next story is, don't ask if you don't want to know. My neighbor is a proper Christian lady and a huge busybody. She was my friend on Facebook and had been for years because she's also the president of our HOA and shares info on her page which I liked having access to. A couple of years ago, I was asked to moderate a relatively large Facebook group So I changed my Facebook name from my legal name to first name middle name, Sally Joe as opposed to Sally Joe Smith. Well, proper Christian lady saw me at the park not too long after and asked why I changed my Facebook name. I didn't give her an answer. She asked me no less than four times over the following weeks, finally cornering me at the grocery store saying, Well, are you ever going to tell me why you changed your Facebook name? I'd had enough. So I flatly said, I joined a swingers group, and I started meeting people on Facebook for no strings attached adult fun. I was concerned about someone learning my identity and stalking me, so I decided to remove my last name for security. She blushed a color I'd never seen before and just walked away. It was glorious, and a week later, I noticed we were no longer Facebook friends. What's more satisfying, embarrassing them like that so badly? or just keeping them on a string for so long and never giving them an answer. Like just driving them crazy for as long as you can. Our next story is, if you don't buy it, you can't have it free. Last month, I closed my physical office and everyone works from home now. Part of closing it was selling off everything in it. We also have a vendor that I had to cancel a contract on, leaving me with a $12,000 bill. The vendor has an office down the hall and I chatted up one of their sales managers, vendor guy, and he expressed that they're planning to expand and might want our space. While the space is a deal with the building, maybe we can trade the furniture for the bill. It's custom for the space and was a lot more expensive than the bill, and he seemed pretty excited about the idea. When we got a couple of weeks away, I got the impression that he was clearly dragging his feet on buying the furniture, and I talked to the building management about hiring their waste contractor to haul it all out. Building guy mentions that the vendor said they might want to buy the furniture, so it's clearly come up in their discussions, and asked whether I was abandoning it. I said yes, but also explained the bill and trade I was trying to work out, and stated clearly that I wasn't going to both pay their bill and give them free furniture. I met with the waste contractor. He sounded already familiar with the situation, 
and gave me a very low handshake quote for the work. I got the distinct impression everyone had a plan I wasn't included on. Two weeks before the lease was up, I contacted vendor guy and asked him how it was coming along. He said it was being handled by other folk in his company and I told him to communicate that I needed an answer by the end of that week. I didn't get an answer, so I completely disassembled all the furniture. It took me maybe five days, a giant reverse IKEA for the whole office full of custom furniture and piled it up all in the center of the office. The day before the lease was up, I turned in the keys and paid the waste contractor's invoice. A full week later, I get a very polite email from the building guy asking whether I had the screws and parts to put it back together. No, I explained. I brought them all home along with the connecting plates and smaller metal parts and threw them away there and reminded him that I said if vendor guy didn't buy it, I had no intention of giving him anything for free. A couple of days after that, vendor guy calls me asking about what we left in the space. I explained that he had quite a bit of nerve asking me for anything beyond their bill. Looks like the waste contractor ended up having to do the work I paid them for after all. 100% absolute sleazeball attitude from these vendors and the waste contractor guys. This is exactly what you should have done. Short of doing any like actual damage to any of this furniture, which, you know, might be complain worthy, at least you made it absolutely unbelievably annoying to even consider trying to rebuild this stuff. Our next story is accidental petty revenge. So this happened about 12 years back. We had a few households within our compound and we usually shared stuff like tools, equipment, food, or whatever with the other households. All of us were really close, and this is quite common in our part of the country, we're really social. After all, sharing is caring. Now, I have to stress the fact that no one was forced into sharing anything. It was like this even before my grandfather's time, and it's still the same families that live there, and we just kept on following the tradition, if you can call it that. We had an old, now 72, neighbor, let's call her NB, who just loved food and she was quite hesitant when it came to sharing food, just food, but is more than happy to accept it. But this was never an issue with any of us. After all, she was old and not in her best health. Now, when I say she does not share food, I mean she doesn't share good, edible food. Anytime she shares food, it would be spoiled or rotten and everyone just usually throws it out straight away once she leaves and no one confronts her. Yes, that particular part was our fault. Now, this one time, I was alone at my place and was about to leave for an urgent matter when she knocks on the door. I open it and she hands me a pack of snacks with a smile. Now, she has taken good care in packing it that it almost looks store-bought. I took it with a smile, said thank you, and she heads back home. Now, the idiot I am kept it on the counter thinking I'll throw it out once I get back home and went on my way. After about two hours, I realized that my mom would be back from work, and knowing how well the snacks packed, she might accidentally eat it. I quickly called my mom to tell her to be careful before eating it, but I was too late. Turns out, neighbor's daughter was in town and couldn't get inside her mom's house, as she had locked the doors and left to buy groceries. She came to our place to wait till her mom gets back, and my mom accidentally served her the perfectly packed store-bought looking snack. Once I told her what went on, she immediately checked the snack. It's actually a one bite snack and the change in taste is subtle. The only other way you could tell if it's gone bad is if you rip it open and an oily thread like structure forms between the parts. Kind of like how Spider-Man holds the ripped ship with his web in Homecoming. Later that night, neighbor came to our house to ask for our help in taking her daughter to the hospital. Once it was confirmed it was indeed food poisoning, we told them what had happened, and I could see the anger and embarrassment on the daughter's face. Well, it's safe to say we never got any kind of spoiled, rotten, or damaged food from neighbor, but we still kept on sharing from our end. Well, hey, at least you stopped becoming a dumping ground for their spoiled food. I mean, after that experience, at least it didn't affect anybody in your immediate family, because if so, you probably would have stopped sharing anything with a person like that. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now if you want to hear another awesome revenge story, check out that video on the left. 
Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.